Welcome to the Destiny Church Tees Valley podcast. As you listen, it is our prayer that you were transformed through faith, hope, and love. Time, yes. Our title of this mini series is Come to Worship. And that's what we come for. We come to worship. Now, one of the aspects about worship, though, so often is I hear things from people and uh, they say to me, oh, so I didn't get anything out of worship this morning. The issue is, is worship isn't for you. When we come to worship, we worship God. It is for him, it's about him. And I want to say to you that worship is your number one priority in life. Out of everything else in life, if you don't come to God in worship, nothing else matters. Your career doesn't matter. Your finances don't matter. Your, your family and everything else doesn't matter if you don't come because you will lose everything. Everything rises and falls on your worship to God. Amen? It is so important to us. And one of the reasons that, that, that we know about what God talks about in the Old Testament, God talked a lot about the temple, and there was a tabernacle before that. Um, but before that, they, they, they worshipped in their own, uh, their own place, in their own tent there where, they, where they lived. And I want to say to you that when Jesus came, he changed everything. In other words, we don't have to go somewhere special to worship. We are ourselves a temple of the living God. So that when Jesus died for us on the cross, he made a way. So that no longer did we have to go through someone else to get to the Father, but we have immediate access, every single one of us, to the Father. That's what, that's what is special to us, and yet so often we can take it for granted. Because in the Old Testament, the only person that could have access to the Holy of Holies was the high priest. And the high priest was the only one going, and they would actually tie a rope around the high priest just in case something untoward happened to him when he was in the Holy of Holies so that they could bring him back out again. That's how serious it was that if that priest had gone in in an, un in an unholy manner into the Holy of Holies, there would be consequences. And so you and I are living temples. You are a living temple. You don't have to come here to worship. You can worship in your garden. You can worship in your bed. You can worship on the bus. You can worship in the car. You can worship wherever you are. You don't have to be in any specific place. However, the Word of God does talk to us in Hebrews, and particularly chapter 10, where he talks about us having access to, into, the, uh, into the kingdom of God, having access access to the throne of God, it also says to us that we are a community of builders who are being built into God's house. We are God's house together. You're not the house individually, and you, although you are a temple, your body is to be a temple, so you are to be holy. Now, the issue about holiness is your holiness affects me, and my holiness affects you. Individually, we affect the whole. And so that's why it's important that when we come together, whether that's in our small group or in your family or as a church or even in, as a wider uh, church, whatever we, whatever we do, I want to say to you that, that your personal relationship, your worship to God matters. It matters not only to you, but it matters to us. It is a community uh, um, uh, thing. And, and scripture is very clearly, because sometimes in our English language now we use the word you, but that can be both singular and plural. And often in scripture, most often in scripture, the you is plural. It's talking to the community, it's talking to us. So in other words, my worship affects you. It affects us and it affects our community. And it affects us because God wants us to be a worshiper. But we need to be a people who understand that every aspect of our life needs to be worship. So in other words, it's out of worship and a heart of worship that we should work. So in our, in our workplace, we should come from as a worshiper. We come as one who belongs to God, who honors God, who glorifies God, that everything we do, it's for him. 
So you can go to work and it be for God and be a ministry to God, or it can be just for yourself. So what we do is not what matters, it's why we do what we do. It's the how, it's the heart behind what we do. It is so important that we get this, un- uh, get this right. And part of it is an understanding. We have got to understand how God works and how God sees things. And so often, you know, we see worship as for ourselves. We think to ourselves on a particular on a Sunday morning, one of the things that often uh, gets misunderstood now is that people will talk about a particular segment of the service as being the worship. But that's totally wrong, totally incorrect, and there's no biblical foundation. So in other words, when we sing this morning, that is not worship unless it's done from a heart of worship. So in other words, when I'm preaching today, that can be worship if it's done right. You're listening to to, to me and taking that on board. You can soak that up from a heart as a worshiper, or you can do it from selfish reasons, or you could just be not bothered and not, and then guess it's boring, whatever, I don't understand what's going on. Yes? So in other words, it's the heart that matters in, 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 of what we're doing. That if we are a worshiper, then that is really crucial to us in all that we do. The cross changes everything. Now today I want to particularly, because last week I talked about, uh, about coming to worship and the importance of raised hands in worship, yes? That, that's one of the postures that, uh, that, that God likes and God, uh, God honors and that is uh, beneficial to us. But I want this week to talk about another posture, and that is the posture of kneeling, kneeling before God, yes? And so I want to just again uh, use the scripture just to get you all ready in the flow for Christmas. I don't want you to kind of miss it. I don't want you Christmas to come up and you suddenly think, well, what happened? Did I miss it? But I want you to think, so let's just look at Matthew chapter 2 and a couple of verses in there that just start the illustration of what I'm trying to say today. It says, When the wise men saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down, and what did they do? Now, one of the things that I find quite... Uh, quite um, uh, um, that, that it, in all fairness, I've not always understood, and I've not comprehended it, and even now sometimes... Uh, struggle with it, but actual fact that the, the, uh, the, the, the scholars talk to us and they, they tell us that actually that Jesus at this stage, when the wise men came to him, he could have been two years old. Now, I don't know about you and I, but we always picture Jesus as a little baby, don't we? And though that's when the wise men come, but actually there's the, there's, there's the, there's the understanding that actually he could have been two years. Now, let me ask you a question. Has any of you got a two-year-old? Has any of you had a two-year-old? Has you only been round a two-year-old? <laughs> Maybe some of those upstairs could bring a two-year-old down and we would see what a two-year-old is like. I don't know about you, but when, before I had children, I was quite judgmental about parents of two-year-olds. Fancy, can they not control their children? Well, it's just, they, need, they need to discipline them, they need to tell them, they need to, do, they need to rush them out of the, of the supermarket and, until I had a two-year-old. And then when I had a two-year-old, now sitting on the front row, no longer two-year-old, uh, I suddenly realized things weren't as simple as that. <laughs> yes. and, uh, and so I want you to imagine here that you've got Jesus and he's two years old, and then you have the wise men. These are, the, these are people who are rich, they're affluent, they're intelligent. They are the, the guys that people go to for wisdom and understanding. They come to Jesus, and they bow the knee to a two-year-old. I wonder how many of us would bow the knee to a two-year-old. Yes? In other words... They understood that it wasn't about his physical growth and his demeanor. It wasn't about him. It was about that wrapped in that package was God on earth. He was God in the flesh. They came to worship God. And we've got to understand that, that when we come on a Sunday morning, we come in our connect group, we get up in the morning and we're worshiping individually, we're opening our Bibles, that actually we need to realize we are coming to the King 
of kings. We are coming to the ruler of the universe who created us and sustains us. He only has to say one word and we would cease to exist. And yet in the midst of that, we need to come with a posture of worship. And that means we need to come at times on our knees. We need to come to him on our knees. It is so important for us to understand that. Now, when I was thinking about that, I think we men, there's only probably about two times in our life when we bow the knee. One is when we propose and we get down on the knee. So because we're pleading, hoping uh, that, that we will marry that person that we clearly know is out of our league. And, uh, and so we do that. But then the other time, of course, as guys, when do we kneel? We kneel for a photograph when we're in the team photograph of football or whatever it is. Yes, then we'll kneel because we're proud, whatever as it is. And so we, I believe that this is so important for us to understand that we need to come. If we will bow before our wife, if we will bow before others, we need to bow before our king, our king of kings. So Psalm 95 Verses six to seven. And uh, 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 thanks, Adam is, really works well with us on this because I do go all over the place. And, um, and, and uh, so thank you, Adam. Sam, come, let us bow down in worship. This is David. I want you to know that David, going through many a times in the Psalms, he is going through a difficult time. He's going through anguish. He's going through suffering, going through difficulties. And this is what he says. Come, let us bow. That's an us. Bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Now, the Hebrew word uh, is, is called shaka, and it's mentioned 170 times and means to bow down, to fall down flat, to worship. Why? Because God is a holy God. He is an almighty God. He is a righteous God. And so, but one thing that's quite fascinating, there is in all these texts and all these uh, things where the scripture saying to us, come bow down, not one of them is a command. In other words, it's like God is saying and understands that it is expected of us to bow the knee. It, you would, in other words, you don't have to really tell us, but we know that that is the right posture to have, is to bow before him. Amen? Now, we do know that, uh, that in the Ten Commandments, that it's kind of the first one is God only, and, um, uh, you know, God first, and then God only, the second commandment. So, in other words, we're not to have any other gods, we're not to have any other idols, we understand that, and so there's nothing else we should worship. But we know in life that although we might not physically go to something that we call an idol, but it's amazing how many times we worship things in some kind of way. In other words, whatever we put before God, that is our idol. Anything, no matter what it is, it can be a family, it can be work, it can be, it can be sport, it can be pastimes, it can be football, it could be any number of things. But if we put it before God, it becomes an idol. And so God talks a lot about that. But anyway, what I want to talk about is some of the reasons why we would want to kneel, why we would kneel at times. And the first one is, is we need we will need to kneel in order to pour out our heart to God. It's an opportunity on our knees, because when you get on your knees, you're focused. Uh, you're able to kind of lock in, um, you know, and, uh, and you, whether it's a chair or a couch or whatever it might be that you're kneeling uh, in front or, or it could be stairs, it could be any number of things, but you're able to just to concentrate and to focus with nothing else around. You're not going anywhere when you're kneeling. You are, you are there in place to, to, to pour out your heart to God, and God wants us to pour out our heart to him. Mark chapter 10 and verse 17 talks about a guy. Uh, he says, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? In other words, it is important that this guy, when he went to Jesus, that he understood that he was in a desperate situation, and even though he had everything in this world, he had the riches, he had the, the power, he had the authority, he had all sorts of things, but actually 
He didn't have the essentials of life. He didn't have eternal life. And he knew that Jesus had it. And therefore, in honor, he bowed to the supreme. That's why we don't bow to those in in any society that are lower than us. We're always bowing to people that are above us. That's why they they, they bow to the queen. They bow to the king. They bow to to the presidents. There's there's an honor in there. But actually, God is not saying, I just want you to bow for the sake of bowing. He says, I want you to come before me and pour out your heart. In other words, if you're going through a difficult situation, God wants to hear from you. He wants to hear it. And so often, we are, we, when we're in trouble, it's the last place that so often we go to. God wants us to love him with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength. Now, David, as he would go, going out through all sorts of difficulties, in Psalm 142, says this, I pour out before him my complaint. Before him I tell my trouble. I cry to you, Lord, I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. And Psalm 62, verse 8 says, Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. In other words, David's saying, however difficult it is, God wants to hear from you. And sometimes in Scripture you'll hear David pouring out his heart to God and he's He's, been, uh, he's on the run maybe and there's people after him and there's all sorts of situations in. And you, sometimes he talks and you think to yourself, wow. So he said to God, God, I, pray, I ask you to knock his teeth out. And I, I know you're going, what, what, what? In other words, David is open and he's honest, he's real, he's authentic. He's saying, this is how I feel, Lord. They're after me. I want you to kind of to, to defeat my foes. I want you to be, to be victorious over them. So in other words, God can handle your complaint. God can handle your anguish and your difficulties and the things that you don't understand. He's after you just saying to Lord God, I don't understand this. It just doesn't make sense. I'm frustrated by this. I'm angry at this. Whatever it might be, we need to understand that. Because when we come to him and we pour out our hearts to him, he is our refuge. He becomes, it's like, I don't know if you you as when children, whether you had a safe place to go to. Um, You know, it might have been kind of, uh, a safe place might have been in a little cupboard. And you felt if you got in that cupboard, it was safe. Or it might have been a blanket. It might have been, it might not have been a, a place. It might have been a person. Often it's, it's mum or, or dad, whatever. And it, it, it could be certain things. In other words, as children, we run somewhere where we feel safe. You know, it might be under the bed. Or if you're in bed and you think the gremlins are going to get you, you know, you make sure your feet don't hang over the edge because you know they'll get you if you... <laughs> So, the, so, but, but I'm saying is God is our refuge. When we come to him, he wants to be our helper. He has his arms open saying, will you come to me? Whenever, whatever the difficulty, whatever it is you don't understand, will you come to me? We've got to, as that song we sung earlier, we've got to understand that when we come to him, we need to remember God's faithfulness in the past. Because God has been faithful. And it's actually when you kneel in prayer and you come to worship is to recall, particularly the difficult times, when you you come across something and you're needing a miracle, you're needing to know a way out, you're not sure how things are, you come to God and you're able to just to to, to share it with God and he makes a, a, a way for you. He enables you to be able to see from a different perspective. But the main thing is, is coming and understanding what he's already done. It's important to us to understand what God has already done. Oh God, I remember when you provided for me. I remember, Lord, when you got me out of that fix. I remember, Lord, when that person was coming for me and, and, uh, and you, you, you gave me a friend who was bigger and faster and whatever. And so God, God does very things. You start to remember that. yes. You need to do that whatever level you are. There can be small things or big things, but when we, when we focus on God and we, we come to him and say, Lord, I remember this, will you do it again? Will you do it again? Psalm 42, probably written by David when Absalom rebelled. He says this, my tears have been my food day and night, 
while people say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. My, why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my saviour and my God. That's the key, is coming to worship a God who can change things. In Lamentations chapter 3, Jeremiah went through a lot of suffering as a prophet of God and a lot of ridicule, a lot of uh, uh, hardship in so many ways. In Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 19, these are verses uh, right up to there, uh, all talking about anguish and, and the pains uh, and the complaints that, uh, that, that Jeremiah is uh, giving. And in verse 19, it says this, I remember my affliction and my wondering. He was homeless. The bitterness and the suffering. I well remember them and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassion never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. We sang it earlier. God is a faithful God and we need to take that and put that in our hands. You know, when we push through the pain to the place of praise, it changes your perspective and you're able to live in light of who God is and to see the miracles that God has in store for you. Let's make our cry an offering to God because it is an offering to God, isn't it? Lamentations chapter two and verse 19 says this, pour out your heart like water in the presence of the Lord. You see, kneeling to pray gives you the ability to stand when there's opposition, to stand when the circumstance is against you, to stand when other people are accusing you or other people are, uh, are ridiculing you or saying to you, where is your God? The second thing about kneeling is kneeling in repentance. And, uh, and because every one of us do things that break the heart of God. Yes, in Luke chapter 5, um, the first kind of seven verses are giving a background of, uh, of the, some of the disciples were fishermen and they've gone out fishing and they've caught nothing even though they've been out all night. And Jesus is, uh, is busy teaching on the seashore and the crowds are hemming in. And so he sees two boats, he gets into one of the boats and he goes off and, uh, and starts to preach in the, in the boat. And one of the boats that he's in is in this uh, guy called Simon, um, as we know as Simon Peter, uh, who became an apostle. And, uh, and so he goes out, and then, and then when he's finished teaching, Jesus says to, to Simon, he says to him, he says, okay, what I want you to do is I want you to take your boats out, and I want you to drop your nets again. And, uh, and so Simon's answer is, um, we've been out all night, and we've caught nothing. Now remember, Simon is a fisherman. It's his profession. He knows how to fish. He's skilled at fishing. He spent his life from childhood learning to fish. He knows the lake. He knows the Sea of Galilee. He knows what, what it's about. He knows all the aspects of it. He could probably virtually talk to the fish and bring them in. But of course, in this instance, he's caught nothing. has been all right. But what does he say to him on verse 8? He says, um, sorry, verse uh, Seven, um, we've worked all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, that's worship. That's what God is looking for. What does God say to you? What is God saying to you? Because if you do what he's saying to you, guess what? You will find the benefits of that. And you can't until you do. It's a faith aspect. You've got to trust. You've got to believe. And as you do and you step out in faith, you see what God can do. And it says, because you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. That's full. Yeah, 
Just in case you're wondering how full's full, it's so full, it's sinking. Yes, it can't hold anymore. And how does Peter, or Simon, uh, Simon Peter, how does he respond to this? Yes, because you've got to realize it's kind of like, on the rational level, it doesn't make sense. It's a little bit like when Jesus says on another occasion, he says, to drop the nets down on the other side of the boat. It's like kind of like, Oh, the fish know to not go to that side of the boat. It's like the fish are going, I'm playing hide and seek. You know what I mean? And, and then suddenly there's a catch of fish. It, it, and this is, this is how uh, it just does, doesn't rationally make sense. But this is what he says. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh, Lord, please leave me. I'm too much of a sinner to be around you. How does a catch of fish bring such a response? Because Simon Peter understood that he was in the presence of someone who was a fisher above all fishers. Someone who could control the seas, control the fish in the seas, could control things beyond his explanation. This was something he had never seen in his whole life. And yet here today, God did something in that place and God will do something for you as well. It doesn't matter how desperate it is. It might seem like the bank account's empty. It might seem there's no fish. Uh, 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 you know, you've not caught no fish. It might seem that, that business is not going well. It might seem that, that all the, 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 you know, the things that you normally look to have gone and you're feeling, well, nothing's come through. What am I going to do? Well, I tell you, if you will kneel before Jesus, he will make you into a fisher. Yes, he will make you able to fish for things that you've never been able to fish before. And thirdly, we need to kneel in submission. We need to kneel, and we've sang about this morning, in surrender, in honor and humility before the Lord. You see, coming to, to the Lord in surrender is not something that we like. We don't like the word surrender because it talks of defeat, it talks of losing, it talks of, you know, of kind of, uh, um, you know, it sets the feelers that we struggle with. And for some of you, you love winning. You love that. You will do anything to win. Yeah, the, the, you know, you want to succeed. You don't want to kind of think. Anything that talks about defeat in your life, even, you know, as a Christian faith, you think, we do, I don't mind talking about victory, but I don't want to talk about surrender. I don't want to talk about kneeling. I don't want to talk about giving my life uh, to others. Now, I remember when faith was little, uh, I used to, uh, uh, wrestle with faith. Of course, she was only little, so of course, it, uh, dad was able to easily win, of course. Well, you would think, but as a two year old, <laughs> she would not give in. I'd say, Daddy's the greatest, and she'd say, No, Mummy's the greatest, and I'd say, No, Daddy's the greatest, say, No, Faith's the greatest. Alice would go on, and I'd think, How long is she going to go on for until eventually she will surrender? Well, you can guess. <laughs> she had a very stubborn spirit. There was no way was she ever going to surrender. And so we too often have that kind of attitude, don't we? We have that hard thing. I'm not surrendering to nobody and to no one. I'm not, I'm not allowing somebody to have authority over my life. I'm not allowing someone to be able to speak into my life. But that's what God is looking for. That's what worship is. Worship is saying and coming to God and saying, you are supreme. You know what's best. You are the strongest. You are the mightiest. You are, uh, you, you are the, the, the warrior. You are the valiant one in all of this. Now, in some cultures, of course, um, uh, submission and, uh, 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 is, is a, an honor, and it's done a lot in some cultures. In our culture, it's not done uh, very often, yes? Our culture really does not like to submit. But Romans chapter 6 and verse 13 says, Give yourselves to God. Surrender your whole being to him to be used for righteous purposes. Amen. You see, true worship brings pleasure to God. And it happens when we try to please God, when we come to him. And so God is looking for us with our, uh, with our knees bent before him in humility, surrendering to him. We can bend the knee and raise our arms and say, Lord, I surrender to you today because I want your will to be done in my life and in my family in my workplace. Amen? That's what we need to do. Now, of course, one of the issues with that, you've got to trust God. And so, in other words, it's always a trust issue. If you won't surrender to someone that you don't trust, 
And so that's why so often we don't want to, uh, to give people uh, responsibilities. We don't want to give people uh, positions of power if we don't trust them. Yes? And so that's the same now, isn't it? You know, we, we look at the world scene and there are some world leaders. And what are we saying? The world is saying, we don't trust you. Um, so you're not going to submit to them. You're not going to be in a relationship with them. Well, you've got to, to be in a relationship with God. You have to trust him. You have to trust him. Yes? But we've got to realize that when we give ourselves to Jesus, we discover that he is not a tyrant, but a savior. He's not a boss, but a brother. He's not a dictator. He is a friend. And that is one of the issues with us. We just, our pride stops us from raising our hands, from bowing the knee, from expressing our love to God. We mustn't let pride get in our way. Our supreme example, of course, is Jesus. When he was about to go to the cross, he understood what was happening. And he was in Gethsemane and he prayed. And it says there, Jesus withdrew about a stone's thrown beyond the disciples, uh, beyond uh, his disciples, knelt down and prayed. This was a prayer of submission, of surrender to the Father. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Take this Issue where I don't want to suffer, yet not my will, but yours be done. That's what we do when we kneel in surrender. We say, not my will, but your will done. Jesus did it, and genuine followers of Jesus will say, Father, I don't understand what's happening. I don't understand the pain I'm going through. I don't understand my health issues. I don't understand my financial issues. I don't understand whatever it might be, but I'm going to trust you. And I know, Lord, you can bring glory out of that situation. If only we will do that and surrender. Surrender is hard. It's difficult. And, you know, if it was easy, we would all do it, but we don't. It's like warfare when we surrender to him. Will we surrender to Jesus? The issue is, you can either bow the knee now, or, uh, because you want to, because you're willing to, or one day, you will be forced to kneel. You will not have a choice about kneeling. Because Scripture says clearly, and it says in a number of, uh, of uh, instances based from Isaiah, but particularly in Philippians 2, verses 8 to 11, it says, and being found in appearance as a man, Jesus humbled himself Uh, And by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee will bow. So the only choice we have is now or later. But when we do it later, we will be forced to do it, and it will, be, um, it will be detrimental to us. But if we do it now out of a heart, because we want to pour out our heart to God, because we want to say, God, I'm sorry, I, I, need, I need your uh, forgiveness, I need your help, I need your strength. And if it's out of surrender, I want to say to you that God will always respond. He comes running to any child that will do that. So we're going to sing now. We're going to sing one or maybe two songs. And, uh, and I just want you to, to think about that, about your worship, as you worship now. Now, maybe you want to, this morning, you might want to raise your hands in, uh, before the Lord and just to exclaim here, to praise him, to declare victory, to ju- just to say, Lord, I am just so uh, uh, you know, pleased with what you've done. You might want to do that. Or for some of you, uh, it may be you want to, Um, show your worship to God by giving. Maybe you haven't been giving and you'd like to give and you maybe start to tithe or whatever it might be. Giving is the heart of worship. Yes, because surrender is giving of ourselves. We offer ourselves to the Lord. It's about giving. So maybe today as we sing these, you may say, I need to give something. Hopefully you may be going to say, I want to give my life to Jesus today. And if you want to do that again, put it on the Connect card. Uh, or talk with us afterwards. Um, it's the greatest decision you'll ever make in your life. Or third, maybe what you might want to do is you might want to just kneel. 
if you're able to kneel. And, uh, and just to be able to say, Lord, I'm coming because I need to pour my heart out to you today. I'm coming because, Lord, I'm kneeling in repentance. And maybe today you're kneeling just out of that sense of, Lord, I give my life to you. I surrender everything to you. The things that I held dear, I'm allowing you to, to, to know that. Will you do that as we sing uh, these songs? Amen. You've got an opportunity now to put some of this into practice. So however you'd like your posture of worship to be, you choose that. And we're just going to spend a moment now giving our heart and worship.
46, 10 says, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Sometimes we need to just take the posture to be still. And remember who is king. Who is all powerful? God, you are the one that we adore. You are the one that we come to worship. You are the one that we lay our lives down. You are the one that we want to sing of and to, to worship and to serve all the days of our life. We don't want to wait until we're made to bow down. We want to choose surrender. God, we pray that our worship is pleasing unto you because it's for you only. And we pray that you will help us to continue in the posture of worship wherever we end up going, whatever season of life we walk through. If we've got breath in our lungs, we've got worship to be poured out. Help us, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks for listening today. If this message spoke to you and you would like prayer, or perhaps this is your first time listening, then we'd love to connect with you at www.thedestinychurch.co.uk forward slash connect. You're welcome to join us every Sunday in person or online at 11am.